Welcome everybody to our two o'clock time slot. My name is Tina Costa and I'm one of the directors with the Office of Virtual Health. I again continue to be your host, uh, proud to be your host today. Um, my pleasure to welcome you or re-welcome you again to the 2023 BC Digital Health Forum inspired by Canada Health Infoways Digital Health Week. Continue to encourage us all to take a moment in our day and share in our collective gratitude for the opportunity to come together from many traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of BC First Nations. May we all take pause to honor their connection to this land and their stewardship in caring for and nurturing these lands for all time. Let us give thanks for today's opportunity to gather, learn, collaborate, and provide care on these beautiful lands. I also have the pleasure today of introducing our next presenter, John Jacob. John is the Executive Director of Strategic Operations at BC Children's and BC Women's Hospital and the Head and Principal Investigator with the Digital Lab, an interdisciplinary research and development unit that he founded at BC Children's Hospital academically integrated with UBC and BC Children's Research Institute. John began his career as a frontline paramedic and went on to lead provincial training programs in emergency medicine at the Justice Institute of BC before joining UBC and PHSA. In his operational role, John oversees strategy, planning, and medical administration, while his research portfolio focuses on health systems innovation, engineering, health economics, and outcomes research. John's academic background includes an MBA from UBC, Masters of Science in Health Economics and Policy from the London School of Economics in the UK, and a PhD focused on innovation, technology, and economics, with a postgrad research training at Harvard Medical School. Wow, okay, over to you, John, welcoming everybody to your talk on bite-sized innovations in pediatric health. Five by five with the digital lab. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, introduction. I'm just going to share my screen over here as well. Yeah, quick moment while I switch over to this view. I think that should be good. All right. Well, thank you again. Thanks for having me here and uh, and the opportunity to present today. As, uh, as for the introduction, uh, my name is John Jacob, and uh, as I uh, have these two distinct roles within our, our system here at BC Children's, BC Women's. Today, I'm representing primarily my, my research world and the innovation side of the portfolio around the digital lab, which is uh, the, the integrated unit here that's focused on, on digital innovation and technology. So just a, a, a quick background, a little bit about us, and you can understand a little bit more of where we come from. So as I mentioned, we're this uh, integrated research and development unit that's academically kind of aligned to the UBC Faculty of Medicine. And uh, our, the vision really around building this is, is can, we, can we get a healthier future through digital innovation? And our mission and as an applied research and development team is to really design, build, and test human-centered digital solutions that can transform care, how we deliver it, and ultimately to, to improve health in general. And so the, the main functional domains that we work in is strategy and design, engineering and technology, and research and evaluation. And it kind of aligns with what I said around we design, build, and test, and, and rigorously evaluate that. What's unique about us is, is uh, while we're a research unit and connected and through the Research Institute, we're quite cross-disciplinary, working with a number of partners, clinical partners, and spanning clinical care, education, and research. And so the different technical domains that we work in include software, web development, AI, and some of the things that I'll go over today, but also in, in media development and medical illustrations and e-learning products and tools, advanced simulations, and, and some, you'll see that through some of the projects that we're going to showcase. The, really, the approach that we take here is this model that we talk about kind of called the, the D5, which it's not novel. We've just added a, a couple uh, a couple kind of spins to to make it a little bit more ours, but to diagnose the the problem, really get a deep understanding for what we're trying to solve and uh, what we're trying to uh, approach, and then to design these human centered and value based solutions, develop those, deploy those both in a simulated setting and also uh, integrate them directly into the real world. The luxury being we're part of the hospital, 
uh, and then to discover. And we put discover at the end, which is around rigorously validating these types of solutions, evaluate them, and then learn from it. Uh, the, the best part is, is, is that then it's repeating this cycle over and over. And that's really what we try to, to focus on as a part of our work. And I, a quick, you know, for, by the numbers, just so you get a sense of scale from the work that we do, about 80 projects, uh, 20 projects going on at any given point in time, 10 or, 10 or so research projects that are ongoing right now. Our staff ebbs and flows, uh, depending on the different cycles. We have also students that join us, about 30 or so right now. And you can get a, a sense of some of the other statistics there in terms of our reach. So today was about kind of this rapid fire showcase. We, we tend to do quite a lot with the with the lab and it's uh, as a part as opposed to going pretty deep into one specific case i'm hoping that the purpose of today is to spark some collaboration spark some interest in, in maybe partnering with us and getting in touch and so i i kind of paint a broad picture in this uh, rapid fire showcase focus on five key themes that we're currently working on though there's many uh, within the overall portfolio and so digital health literacy is a big component of our work 3d printing and virtualization Therapeutic games and play as a part of the therapy, artificial intelligence, and some new projects we're working on in this field, and then extended reality or augmented reality and virtual reality, which I think we can, uh, we're all aware is becoming an increasing part of the technology landscape right now. So I'll start with the digital literacy, uh, but I'm not going to go too deep into these projects and just give you a bit of a snippet on each of these type, this is the type of project that we work on uh, in this world of digital literacy. And, and what we're trying to do with this is enable patients and families to take control and, and efficacy of, of self, develop self-efficacy of their own health conditions and understanding both about their health condition, but also how to access information about health. And so we have a series of tools that I'll kind of go through pretty quickly, but just give you a sense of my care path is one of these types of products where we're supporting kids with chronic pain, helping them understand that what they're going through. And we developed this through a storybook, an interactive storybook quite journey. Uh, the new version of this is launching in a couple months. We've got the current version that you can access online right now. Mycarepath.ca was a it was a project that we did about six or so years ago now, and we're revamping this uh, a whole new version of it. Um, animation forward, uh, you'll 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 see some news about this in the coming months. Another product that's along the similar vein here is Allergy Check, which is a mobile app for parents uh, helping to identify food allergies in their kids. We've developed this uh, algorithm that you can see a picture of in the background there. That's quite a complex algorithm of, of uh, decision support and helping to identify whether or not there's an allergy, a likelihood of that. A tool that we launched in partnership with our Division of Endocrine and Allergy and Diabetes is the Learn Diabetes tool, a platform again to help enable our patients and families in taking control of their own um, conditions and, and understanding how to manage them and, and other support resources that are available. And you'll see with all these tools, as we, we get the luxury of being within a, a children's hospital in that domain, a lot of this is really forward in the visuals and the aesthetics, and also in using mechanisms like animations and, and explainer style videos to explain concepts and give people a chance to understand things in a way that's more accessible to them. A, a similar project that we're about to launch uh, in coming in February, uh, around the time of Valentine's Day for good reasons, is our Heart Hub. Uh, which is a, a new mobile app and platform to help uh, parents and, and families again that have gone through or are going through care through our cardiac center and our, our, our post-operative care. And this is a this is a project that leverages a number of different um, technologies and areas where we've blended in our 3D printing and virtualization that we'll talk about. Um, and into this along with animations to explain the different conditions uh, and the set of resources to help them navigate through their journey. The Digital Seizure Action Plan is a, another app here that's, that's focused on <clears throat> helping to, right now, uh, uh, helping to have pa parents and families have access to their, their kids' uh, seizure action plan. So what to do in the, in the case of a, of a seizure. And right now, you know, parents might fold these up and have them in their... Uh, pockets or on their phones through a PDF. This is a, an app that is going to help to distribute that, uh, but also have access and, and connect the caregiving team with the parents and families um, and, and offer some unique features that currently doesn't exist. 
So on the other, um, another theme of ours is this uh, 3D printing and virtualization. And so for the unfamiliar, I'll just give you a, a quick uh, uh, kind of overview on what this might mean. So uh, there's there's these three, there's different mechanisms for uh, for manufacturing. And, and if you're not familiar, there's formative, which you might start with a, a structure and then you'll fill in something to get into whatever object you're trying to create. Subtractive, where you start with something big and you carve it out to get something small. And then additive, which is the, the kind of technical term for 3D printing, where you're starting with uh, nothing and you create layer by layer to create whatever object uh, that you that you want. And so for us on the 3D printing side, we're using this, uh, this 3D printing and, and the virtualization of that in a number of different areas, such as pre-surgical planning, interoperative guides, using it for training and simulation, but also creating custom medical devices and, and using this to support parents and families and, and teaching them about their condition is a very different to be able to hear about the condition that you have as opposed to be able to touch, feel, and hold something like in this picture here. And so I, I'm gonna share a couple case studies of how we're using this technology. And one of them here is uh, within our cardiovascular care. And the picture that's on the left there is actually a 3D model that we've created from a uh, patient's CT scan. And we've turned that, we've taken the data from that, we've we virtualized it into a 3D model, and then we've printed a physical model that's the exact replica of the patient's anatomy, in this case, their heart. And you can see, if you look very closely there, this is a model that we, um, we in partnership with the, the clinical team, but the interventional cardiologist in this case, pre-stented this uh, model before the actual surgery. And so enabling a whole different level of simulation and pre-procedural planning. I'm gonna talk about this in a, in a moment here, but I'll give you a, a different example of where we're also using this, even for something as, as kind of seemingly simple as being able to create a, a custom prosthesis for a kid here who has a, a special condition that is a deformity of their legs. And you know, we, I remember talking to the patient family about this, where they just were wearing different, different size shoes. And, uh, and you, know, you can see, I'll just play this again. You can see when we created this custom jig for this kid, he was just, Ecstatic and running up and down the halls here uh, because he could. And it's just great to see like there's different types of solutions that we can do even just from these technologies like this. So I'm gonna dive into one that one case study that's a little bit more in depth. And, and this is a case, uh, it's called osteogenesis imperfecta. You might've heard a colloquial term called brittle bone disease. And this is a real case, but we've, we've anonymized the data here. Uh, but a nine-year-old child has, came through um, and, and needed to have surgery on, on, their, on their legs, essentially. And so there's currently, um, a, the condition is that it, it, one of the um, kind of core ways that this manifests is in bowing of the legs or bending of, of the bones. And so the child had uh, this, this existing bowing and, and the point that as a part of the surgical procedure was to straighten out those uh, bones. And so in the next slide, you'll see, this is kind of what we do from an overall surgical plan, where we take the data that is, comes from the existing medical imaging, and then we turn it into these anatomical models through a complex series of, of processes that take that data, we, we virtualize it and, and turn it into these 3D models, and then we're able to pull it into a, a separate set of kind of processes that allow us to do pre-surgical planning. And so that surgical planning here, you can see is, We've not only just modeled it like in the middle frame in terms of what it looks like, but also what the end stage would be. And in this case, the goal was to um, go from what's on the left side here to what's on the right side. And in this case, we've created, because of the data that we have, we created these custom surgical guides or jigs. And what is reflected here are, those are the cutting planes. That's exactly where the surgeon would cut and where the drill holes would be and where these other instruments would get kind of com compounded onto the bone uh, in order to, to maintain this straight shape. And so you can see when we go through and do the custom surgical guide, and then we print these bones, these are not the actual kid's bones, uh, for, for obvious reasons, we haven't extracted them, but we've created an exact replica and we've been able to validate that, that identical um, workflow using basically the, the patient's own anatomy and then validate that. And then I've blurred this out because uh, I don't, you know, I know uh, not everyone might be in this same uh, sphere of, of medicine, but uh, in the middle frame there is us actually using that jig 
uh, in intraoperatively and the, the surgeon, um, in this case, one of our orthopedic, pediatric orthopedic surgeons, being able to take this, we print it, we sterilize it locally on site here. It's customized. It's in, in with the patient's uh, other surgical equipment and um, it get, gets used intraoperatively. And so happy to report that the outcome of a, of a technique like this and a set of processes like this is, uh, is you know, really positive. And we look at as a part of our research, what type of impacts can these have? Um, and those include increased accuracy in terms of what we intended to do or what the surgical team intended to do and how we've been able to, to match to that. Also, it enables for less radiation to the child uh, because you don't have to do as much intraoperative imaging, smaller incision sizes, there's also some benefits from an efficiency standpoint and some of our, our research around uh, the total length of time that it takes to do this. If you can imagine when the, when the cuts are predefined, there's some pretty substantial gains. And so there's a lot of work we were, we're thankfully, we've been doing this for a while now and we're expanding this thing uh, across both the hospital, but also the province. Uh, but the field is rapidly advancing in itself. And so, you know, these are some of the directions that we're heading in. These aren't our studies, but this is showing about the, the field. And so we, we are doing some work right now in metal 3D printing, um, also in looking at this from a biologic. So we've done some early prototyping and not just printing plastics and other polymers, but also in printing biological materials. And so the hope is that one day we'll be able to print not just a, a plastic that would be able to, or, or a material that would be able to fit into the bone, but also a biological material, maybe even made of the, own, the patient's own cells. So another area that we're focused on here is in digital media and games. And this has become a, a growing part of our portfolio, quite different and distinct from the 3D printing in, uh, in contrast, uh, but, but Pretty, pretty massive. And so, you know, we think about the digital studio, which is a kind of a sub name that we call the this part of our portfolio of the merging of design, art and technology. And we create a number of these media products. We get the benefit of being able to do it again from the, the child focus and this energy on, on animations and accessible design and diversity. And so uh, a big area of our, our focus is really on, on that. It's, it's not just meeting kids where they are and being able to develop media products that resonate with them, but also that they're reflected in this, in this media and, and as is the broader population. And we go through process of looking at diversity matrix, making sure that there's representation uh, of, of racial, ethnic differences, but also accessibility and ability differences. Um, and then we've got uh, other areas that we're focused on in, in terms of building games. And so the media in this case is not just videos and animations, but also in taking the notion of games, the beauty of it being, you know, this is meeting kids where they're at as well. And then also in the, I, in the area of immersive media and virtual using virtual reality and augmented reality. I'll talk a little bit more about that as it's its distinct section on the immersive media. Uh, but I also wanted to share with you some growing area, which is in the therapeutic games. And so this example is a project that we're working on right now to help uh, gamify pre-hospital learning and simulation. And some of you might remember, you know, this is everything has its cycles of a retro, retro style 2D top-down game that, that was common uh, many years ago. And as it's taking a cycle again, we're creating a game like this that's exploring uh, the insides of BC Children's Hospital and giving children an opportunity to go through and learn about the different areas. It's not exactly a replica, that'd be a pretty big, pretty big game, but it, it gives the general, uh, this is just a, a portion of what it will look like, but it gives a general sense of, uh, of the hospital and people will go into, the kids will be able to navigate on their mobile phones into the imaging area or into the um, into the waiting room or even into the cafeteria and learn about what's there and interact with characters uh, in, in not just from a text base, but also using different languages. And then we're, we're prototyping with different voices and being able to have a uh, uh, multiple languages and in, in real voice and not just in, in text. Uh, the nice thing about this is also for, for where there's differences in parental language and in child language, we're able to have parents to learn about this and there's been great reception to a product like this and parents learning in one way and then having a language and, and language differences for children in a different way. Um, similarly, there's another game here that we're working on right now that's, that's around uh, learning and learning about um, 
uh, care, similar to the previous one, but also an engagement and, and get, gathering feedback from patients and families. And this is just some screenshots of some prototyping that we're doing right now for this game where we're uh, trying to solicit patient uh, uh, perception on different technologies and, and robotic use in, inside the, the hospital. And so it just gives you a flavor of some of the things we're working on. And I'm really happy to announce that uh, as similar to our digital studios, this has become a growing area for us. And uh, coming in the new year, we're launching a, a kind of a play on words here, the arcade, which is a series of projects in this game element, a gamified kind of aspect of, of media uh, for therapeutic use. So more to come on that soon. Of course, you know, every day, and I know there's lots of different uh, projects and, and uh, uh, talks over the next week about AI and the use of it. We've got a couple of projects that are going on right now, uh, three main ones. Um, there's a, a couple in the others in the coffer right now, but three main ones we're working on are um, using AI as a, and building a, a deep neural network that is to support uh, diagnosis or, or essentially decision support of um, pediatric fractures. In this case, we're starting with some upper limb orthopedic fractures. Um, and, uh, and then on the uh, second project is around predictive analytics. And so we're using this as a, it's a total kind of a different, um, a different direction here. We're looking to see if we can use a combination of real world data and self-reported data to look at if we can predict workload intensity for our care providers that enables us in the future to kind of redistribute how we might organize our work um, in a way that we haven't really been able to do before. And so that's that's uh, it's an it's an important and really different direction that's not just focused on the patient care. Obviously, the outcome of this is always that it improved patient care, but it's really using this technology from a different perspective and this notion of big data. Um, and then and then third one, it's actually linked to a broader project called Ideas in Digital Health. And in this case, the Ideas stands for Inclusion, Diversity, Equity, Ethics, Access, and Safety. And this is, is really looking about how can we take these notions of these concepts and meaningfully integrate them into any of the products and projects that we do. Uh, and so one of the ways that we're using AI that's related to this is, is by essentially taking, whether it's our media projects or any of our software and using what's, what's become increasingly available over the last year to uh, modify and have representation, whether that be in a, uh, character style that might look a little bit more like the patient and family or by having a voice style or a different language and not just having subtitles, which is better than nothing, but um, but being able to dub something over and then not have, you know, being able to do that at a much faster pace because of the, the access to the technology. And so it's a big area that uh, we're really excited about. And finally, I'll leave you with um, you know, really exciting progress. And I'm sure many people have been following the, the world of extended reality and how this is going to, you know, I think how this is going to change a lot of what, what we're, what, how we deliver care and, and uh, in this world. But around pre-procedural preparation, therapeutic distraction, these are, these are different areas in, in how we're using uh, AR and VR. And so um, very quickly, I'm just going to walk through a, a, a case study that we did around uh, using this AR or using a virtual reality simulation for uh, pre-procedural preparation for kids before they're going through an MRI. And so we use this by saying, how can we provide this experience uh, and simulate the virtual reality, uh, uh, sorry, simulate the, the experience using virtual reality to the point where we might be able to reduce their anxiety enough that can convert them from being needing to have sedation to, to being able to go through the same um, uh, procedure without sedation. And there's a, there's a certain cohort of, of uh, kids that you can convert them if you can reduce their anxiety and help them hold still. And so what's reflected in here is uh, this is some screenshots from the game and virtual reality experience that we created. I recruited the help of my, my trusty uh, nephew there uh, to be one of the, one of the characters in this, uh, in this experience. And, and uh, as a user, you go through, you watch another child do it, you go through it yourself, and you go through a training game. And we studied this, we, we did a randomized control trial to look at how this compared to the current status, status quo, uh, and found that there was a, um, a, a not clinically significant difference between these, which is what we wanted to see between the standard of care and this. The idea is never to rep or replace or or take away work from our amazing child life specialists, but how do we increase access across the province and to this type of technology? 
We also did a follow-up economic study. You can see these uh, published if you want to know more about this. Um, and uh, and you know, we're really happy to say that this has moved through to another stage of, of research right now and uh, seeing what else we can do. So I leave you with this, this rapid fire. That was a lot to digest uh, for myself and Clues. A lot of fun things going on. I hope I've inspired you to maybe look, reach out and collaborate with us. Uh, we, we do more together. And so, you know, our, our aim here is to transform tomorrow. Of course, uh, this, it takes a village. I'm just, a, you know, one. Now this is possible without our fantastic team that's behind the scenes. A, an amazing team I feel privileged to work with and our partners in both our clinician side and our patients and families. Thank you all for listening and, and happy to take any questions if you have time. Thank you so much, John. Really enjoyed hearing about the exciting innovations happening at the Digital Lab. I still can't quite get over the 3D printed heart and the image of that little guy running down the hallway. That was just super cool. So thank you. I have no doubt people on the line are going to want to know more, going to want to reach out and learn about um, the other innovations that are coming our way from your team. We do have one question in the chat that we've got time for. Um, wondering, uh, what software framework do you use for your app development, John? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, it's very, it's quite varied. Uh, this is the easy answer because we really cater things to what's needed, and sometimes that's uh, building from scratch through, uh, through you know, it's a kind of a standard modern stack, React stack, if we are using that, or we're even looking at low code solution solutions for certain things and no code. So it's really quite, uh, quite varied across the different projects. But I'm happy to discuss further if anybody wants later. Wonderful. Well, I will encourage our audience to reach out to you. Be careful what you wish for, but uh, really great to see the really great things happening to support our pediatric patients and families. We will close here and again, just deploy, a, a, send you guys all a short poll to gather your feedback for this particular session. And we'll start transitioning into our next session, which is entitled version 2.0 from pandemic stopgap to program adoption, development of the Shapedown BC virtual curriculum. Once again, you can navigate via the panel on the left-hand side of your screen to join us there in just a few moments. Thank you again, John.